You're listening to the Apple Insider Podcast. Welcome to the 103rd episode of the Apple Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Victor Marks, and joining me as ever is our fantastic editor-in-chief, Neil Hughes, of the AppleInsider.com website. Hey, Victor, how are you? I'm amazing. How are you? <laughs> amazing. I, I am. I'm well-rested. I'm in top shape, top form, and ready to do this. Let's do it. All right. So first up is th- th- this week we're celebrating a momentous event. Do you know what it is? I do, and I'm kind of surprised that we're celebrating this week because um, although people are saying the iPhone launched 10 years ago, it did not technically launch 10 years ago. It was announced 10 years ago. Uh, the iPhone was announced at Macworld uh, 2007, January, but did not actually make its way into the hands of consumers until later in the year in June. June 29th, to be precise. Mm-hmm. So what this means is we get two iPhone birthdays, which I kind of like. So for, first of all, why, tell, tell me, why would Apple announce a phone six months before anyone could actually have it? Uh, the same reason that they announced a tablet three months before anybody could have it or a watch uh, eight months before anybody could have it because it takes time to uh, bring these things to market, to ramp up production. You don't want to have leaks. You want to have developers have time to, uh, in the case of the first iPhone, they couldn't create actual apps for it, but they could create web apps for it. Um, And with more recent platforms, native apps for those devices. So um, Apple announced the iPhone in January of 2007, launched it six months later, uh, giving developers some time to make uh, web apps uh, before the App Store existed uh, for the first iPhone. Um, and one of the things that, you know, we look back on the iPhone and, and uh, you know, everybody remembers seeing that announcement. You can watch it again on YouTube. It's pretty awesome. It's a, arguably the best keynote presentation Apple's ever done. Steve Jobs at top form, a product that was so ahead of its time. Um, the concepts that seem kind of novel now at the time were revolutionary uh, things like using your finger to to touch the screen things like not using a stylus things like not having a physical keyboard um the fact that there was you know only one button on the front of it uh you know run down the list of things that uh uh now we kind of take for granted but at the time people were saying it was going to be a failure based on those things but uh, having said all that, it is also important to remember that the first iPhone was not particularly successful. I think it took Apple like a full year to sell one million iPhones, and now they sell that in like five minutes. That's true. the The other reason why it took them, uh, why they had pre announced by six months, was that the um, the FCC maintains a website mm-hmm. where they list all of the applications and the testing results, and they they show pictures of what the devices are that they're testing, and so Apple had to both comply with the FCC and didn't want the FCC to pre-announce the device for them. At right. the time, the ru- rumors were flying. Surprise. Right. Rumors were flying that Apple was going to make an iPhone. And pe- there, there were people that had prospectively bought the iPhone.com domain. There were all kinds of people saying at the time that you couldn't do it because Cisco owned the iPhone trademark. Mm-hmm that they must have called us something else. Well, it turned out that, that what they did was they, first of all, they announced it so that they couldn't, wouldn't have the FCC pre-announce it for them. And they licensed the iPhone name in an arrangement with Cisco only after they'd actually announced the device. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and that first one, uh, you know, I once, I once talked with um, one of the guys who'd worked on the first one. Mm-hmm. Uh, his, let's see here, let me pull up his actual name because I only remember his uh, the name on his business card which is not exactly accurate um, Andy Grignan so uh, a- Andy is a you know was was uh, a starter of the web OS phones but before he started on web OS he, he built dashboard and iChat and he also worked on the very first iPhone and what he was telling me was that um, he you know, he he. Uh, when they were doing it, in that presentation where Jobs demonstrated it, that they had a very specific order that you had to run through the steps in the demonstration. If you got them out of order, it would crash. That if you did anything other than the specific order of steps that they had, it would crash because it was that far away from being actually ready. And uh, that that whenever they did a part of the test in the demonstration and it succeeded, they took a drink sitting there on the front row and that they were, they were 
well into the bottle by the time that, that they'd gotten through it because it just, it was so shaky a demonstration that they'd put together. Um, Jobs, when he was presenting, you know, he, he had the clicker for running the keynote presentation, right. but he always had a paper spiral bound book on the podium and the spiral bound book had all of his presenter notes and the steps to do the test, to do the demonstration. And so he was, he was always consulting the, uh, the, the book kind of thing as they were doing it. And, and Grignan was there on the front and he was there on the front row, um, having a drink <laughs> as they were doing this because it was just so shaky and so, so nerve wracking a demo. I um, I, I was at that Macworld, but I didn't actually see that presentation because I was, uh, I was not in the keynote floor that year. I was doing a booth setup for a booth I was working that year. But it was one of those things where after the keynote, you heard everyone come out awestruck. I had been to other Steve Jobs keynotes and, and they weren't nearly as uh, overwhelming as that one. That was also the year they announced Apple TV, which, um, you know, no one can present like Steve Jobs presented. And, and people were really awestruck with that one too at the show. Of course, after the show, no one really cared about it um, for a long time. But they had, they had at, uh, at, at the Macworld, they had a sort of cylinder that was mostly black towards the floor. And at the top was a glass cylinder or acrylic cylinder with the iPhone in it rotating. So you could just simply see it um, and walk around it. And, and at the time, people like, um, oh, the fellow who writes for Yahoo Tech, who used to write for uh, the New York Times, David Polk, that's the guy. Um, he had demoed the uh, the iPhone. Jobs had put one in his hands at Macworld to try for just a few moon minutes. And, you know, he was only allowed to do a few tasks on it because otherwise it would crash. <laughs> um, we've come a long way. We've come a very long way since that time. Yeah, and, and as I was saying before, it's, it's, it's important to look back and remember that the first iPhone was not particularly successful. Um, not to say that it was a disaster by any stretch of the imagination, but when it launched, um, they they ended up a month after it came out cutting the price um, and giving a iTunes store credit of a hundred dollars to early adopters that had bought within the first couple of months uh, because they you know had to revise the price. Um, it was only on one carrier. Uh, it was in the U.S. on AT and T. Uh, you had to go buy at an AT and T store. You couldn't set it up at home. They wanted you to set it up in the store and activate it. No, 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 no. That's not true at all. Yeah, no, that is. You had to. No, 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 no. I I had mine purchased for me at a store in Oregon and then sent overnight to me in North Carolina, uh, unopened, unactivated, and you plugged it into iTunes and it activated over iTunes. And there was uh, a bit of a nightmare for a bunch of people that first day because iTunes servers got overloaded and it couldn't activate right away. You had to activate it in the store, though. No, you didn't. Mine wasn't. You activated it at home. That was one of their their revolutionary things about it, was that you didn't activate it in stores at all. It activated over iTunes. I swear that... All right, hold on. Let me look this up. <laughs> <sighs> it, was, uh, I, it was with like, no, because the... It activated over iTunes, I swear to God. I think they changed that after a few months, but... No, I had the very first day, though. Mine was purchased on June 29th in Beaverton, Oregon, I believe. This was the miracle okay, of having go. someone wait in line for you. It was 2007. Apple yeah. and AT&T announced that the iPhone, iPhone users will be able to activate their new iPhones using Apple's popular iTunes software running a PC back <laughs> and the comfort and privacy of their own home without having to wait in a store while their phone is activated. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let me back that up. Sorry about that. Memory is uh, fragile. It happens. Well, no, because I, because I had to. They wanted to activate my phone in store when I bought it in store. I think that if you bought it in the store, you had to activate it. There is what it was. Yeah, but mine was bought in eighteen teen store in Oregon, and they didn't. You picked it up at the store, and they didn't activate it. Uh, I had a fellow who waited in line for me and picked it up at the store, and they didn't activate it. They wanted he shipped to it well, to me sealed. Yeah. I know it's a weird one, but. Anyway. But this is also the vagaries of, of letting AT&T be your front-end consumer sales arm, right? Um, you know, you don't know what you get from sales associate to sales associate. And they did try and train them because I have the – there was a training book established that was given to AT&T associates at the time that laid out all the things that could be answered about what is an iPhone for the first generation. 
And, uh, and, and so they had to do this to try and train everyone. Um, it, it really was a big undertaking, especially between this partnership with AT&T and Apple. And it was an interesting one because, as you said, this was why, why did they go with AT&T at the time? They went with AT&T at the time instead of going to Verizon, which they'd approached at the time, uh, because AT&T were the ones that would let them do it on their network without having a uh, AT&T branding all over the thing. Right. And loaded down with AT and T branded software. All AT and T was the number two carrier, and they really wanted to gain ground on Verizon, so they had more to gain. So they were willing to take those kind of "quote unquote" risks. That at the time, in hindsight, you know, it's a no brainer. But by the time the exclusivity window on the iPhone came up, Verizon was champing at the bit to try to be able to get the iPhone on their on their network. Yeah, and this really rocked the whole landscape because at the time, there there was Symbian, which was was. Big worldwide, but in the U.S. was kind of a small portion, uh, and it had apps. Uh, there were the Motorola Razors of the world, right? There were Blackberries, there, which, which was basically a glorified pager that grew into a phone, and then there was uh, the the Microsoft Win CE devices or Pocket PC devices and Palm. And in, in fact, at that time, Palm ran Windows on some of them because they were in a war with their software provider after having sold off the OS, and. This shook up everything. At the time, the one of the CEOs of BlackBerry said somehow they shoved a whole entire Mac into the phone body. Uh, Steve Ballmer was was one of the ones who was amazed at the, that they could do this. Um, Palm CEO Ed Colligan said that these these PC guys aren't just going to walk in here and figure this thing out. It really shook everything. The my I the, the iPhone was actually my first smartphone. I had just had flip phones before that, dumb phones, whatever you want to call them. I was on uh, T-Mobile at the time, and I couldn't afford an AT and T data plan. Um, so I waited until it was like I want to say August or September. It was like a couple months after the iPhone launched, and they finally had not only jailbroken the iPhone, but they had carrier unlocked it. And the day that the hackers announced the carrier unlock was available, I went to an AT&T store. They tried to get me to activate in the AT&T store, and they were giving me a hard time over it. And I told them that I was buying my phone as a gift for somebody, so I wasn't going to activate in the store. So they let me walk out with it. I bought it without an AT&T contract, without having to prove that I was an AT&T customer. Um, I took it home. I plugged it in. I had a, a Windows desktop PC that I had built. Um, and I jailbroke it um, through that. It was a manual process of typing a bunch of instructions in that I found on the internet, went through the whole process. I connected it to T-Mobile um, and T-Mobile had like a $5 a month limited data plan or something. It like wasn't even like technically an official data plan. It was like for like a basic web, like browsing T-Mobile.com or something. But there was a hack to get that around. I'm sure it was all highly illegal what I was doing. But um, and here I am admitting it on the podcast. But yeah. <sighs> Yeah, that was what I could afford at the time. I still have that phone. It's a four gigabyte uh, I, uh, iPhone 2G, as they call it, the original iPhone. Uh, and it has like bubbles that have formed up under the screen and stuff like that. It's because very- the battery's expanding. Yeah, um, but <laughs> it still feels really good in the hand. I mean, the design holds up really well. Uh, and it's a testament to the fact that it hasn't really changed that much over the years. It's gotten bigger and thinner. And, you know, they've obviously had a lot of features, but the basic principle of screen earpiece above home button below and that's the front of your device you know lock button volume buttons uh uh, uh mute switch that's it you know and, and and it hasn't changed yeah before the iphone i was using a couple of different nokias running symbian with some apps loaded on them and uh right before that i was using a windows based palm device one of the palm trios 700 series something or other that i took on a trip to china immediately following that mac world and it was interesting because the people whose booth I was running at the time that that show was on um, were a company that made hardware exclusively for Mac. They made hard drive RAID systems for Mac that were FireWire 900, FireWire 800. They made um, they made TV tuners and digital video import boxes for Mac. They were exclusively all Mac. And the owner of that company wrote a blog post about how he wasn't going to go iPhone. And his reasoning at the time was that he didn't believe in iPhone because it didn't have copy and paste, and his Sony, Sony Ericsson Symbian-based phone did. And it didn't have multimedia system messaging, MMS, where you could send pictures. 
because the first iPhone didn't launch with that feature. Right. And he was sure that any phone that couldn't do copy and paste and couldn't do MMS was clearly destined for the dustbin and wasn't ready for him. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's funny to look back on that first iPhone. You know, it was uh, slow on the 2G network on AT&T, couldn't do MMS, no copy paste, you know. Uh, all the things that were limiting, but to focus so much on those that, you know, it didn't have flash, God forbid, but all those things that were uh, seen as limiting, um, it didn't, it didn't really matter. Certainly not to the point where we are now. <laughs> no. And obviously, you know, uh, next year, the iPhone 3G, they improved the design, they added 3G networking, you know, it was a huge improvement. Um, what was the second iPhone that you got? Did you get the 3G? Uh, I did get the 3G. And that I got that one a little bit later. Um, I got that one at the end of 2008, where I uh, I actually got one that had been taken apart for testing, for uh, locating its intent. So back then, there was this whole thing where people made cases that would augment the iPhone's antenna to try and give it better signal right. through passive coupling. And... You know, you you, you kind of think that, that, well, that can't possibly work. But the truth is that it does work when you make the antenna shape match the antenna shape on the inside of the iPhone and when you when you do it right, um, which is measurable. Uh, and, ta- and, and antenna and radio science is, is kind of a dark art, but there is science to it, and you can test this. And so there was a, a company that I worked for that made the very first passive coupling antenna for the iPhone 1, and they'd taken apart the iPhone 3G in order to make the follow-on product for it, and they decided along the way not to develop that product because the first one wasn't successful at sales enough. And so they'd left the iPhone 3G in parts. And so my first iPhone 3G was one that I got to use by reassembling it. I'm, I'm sure it never really fit <laughs> back together right. I'm it sure was it, like little. It actually, it right. was about perfect because really? there, there, there were only like eight screws or ten screws to the thing, uh, provided you didn't take out the buttons, and they hadn't. Um, there are two screws down by the 30 pin jack and, and about six or eight along the, uh, the motherboard. It was really a simple thing to reassemble. You telling that story just took me back to the days of pre-iPhone where you would uh, get one of those circuitry stickers and pop the battery off your phone and stick it to get the, to improve the signal. Did those Same things actually thing. work? Uh, only if they really matched the antenna as it was on the inside of the phone, which as a sticker, how could it? Yeah, that was one of those things where you did it just because... You were like, well, what could it hurt? You know, you could get it for like five bucks. You'd stick it on right. there and you never really could tell if it would improve your signal. But it was like, ah, it ain't hurting. I remember people right. used to put like multiple ones in it. They'd buy like three or four and stick them under the battery compartment in their cell phone. Yeah, which which is three or four is meaningless. But you, you have to place it right over where the battery, where, where the antenna is on the board on the inside. And it has to match the shape. And that's when things become a little bit better. Uh, There's a case now that actually works like this that optimizes the antenna for the iPhone 6. And they they make it for the iPhone SE and they make it for the 6. And and I don't know if they're doing it for the 7 yet or not, but they also do a passive coupling thing. And it does notably work, especially if you put your iPhone into the antenna diagnostics mode, the carrier diagnostics mode, where you can see the signal decibels as opposed to the bars or dots. Mm -hmm. You can really tell. Now, frequently what happens is because the dots represent a, a, a 10 decibel uh, jump in number, um, you'll, you'll really only see a new dot if you're using one of those cases when, uh, when you're at the edge of one and it crosses you over into the next one. They give about a three to six decibel gain. And so if you're in the middle somewhere, you know, if, you're, if you're at two decibel and you've got a six decibel gain, now you're at eight, you won't see a new dot. But if you're at the boundary of one of them, you'll see a new dot appear showing you that you got more signal. So unless you put it in diagnostic mode, you kind of have to trust that you're getting more. But I have proven that you actually do. I, I went to, so we've got a grocery store here and the back corner by the, the, the dairy section, there's no signal at all. And I've gone back there with one of those cases and in diagnostic mode, gained 6 dB and been able to place a call and get data. Interesting. So it, it can work. My uh, my first iPhone actually lived a long life. I uh, I bought it in 2007, and then I did not uh, upgrade until the iPhone 4 came out in 2010. Ooh. I started working at Apple Insider in 2009, so I actually kept it for another year until finally, because I stayed on T-Mobile and the data plan was cheap, and that was really all I could afford. 
Um, so then finally, you know, it just became impossible to do my job without having a newer iPhone to be able to write about things. So I switched to AT&T and got a formal data plan in 2010. But even after I switched, uh, I don't like wasting technology. I don't like things sitting around collecting dust in a drawer or whatever. So I took my jailbroken first generation iPhone. I mounted it in my car. Now you got to remember the first iPhone did not have GPS in it. And so there was a jailbreak to allow Bluetooth accessories to connect to your iPhone that would not normally be able to connect because Bluetooth is very limited on iOS. So I jailbroke and unlocked the Bluetooth to allow me to connect it to an external GPS puck. And then I had it because uh, there was no data connection in it, obviously, because I didn't, you know, uh, have it activated or anything like that. Um, I ran an offline maps application on my first gen iPhone connected to a G- Bluetooth GPS puck to get navigation in my car back in 2010. That's that's how the Waze, the navigation app that's very popular now owned by Google began, was that, that Waze would on the very first iPhone connect to an external Bluetooth puck and work like this. On, but did, did it require a jailbreak? Because the, the actual to get the Bluetooth puck to work, yeah. 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 But that was their, their beginning. Yeah, so it was, it was funny. I get in my car, I'd have to unlock the iPhone, I'd have to turn on the Bluetooth puck. It would take like four minutes to get a GPS signal, but it was cheaper than going to buy a Garmin because I already had the phone there. Yeah. Well, I used to use it to navigate without proper real GPS, and uh, it was it was um, quite obnoxious in the middle of nowhere in Virginia right. trying to figure out where... You know, at that point, it becomes a glorified compass. Right, yeah. It's actually I'm still uh, heading east. Yes. <laughs> it wasn't that bad um if you were like for example I, I used it to navigate the subways in New York City with the iPhone the original iPhone and it wasn't that bad because there are so many cell towers that triangulating your location would get you to like within a block of where you were. And as long as you knew what street you were on, you go, oh, "Okay, well I got to go that way." And it actually worked. But if you're in the sticks somewhere, forget it. Yeah, you couldn't even load data to show the actual map. You're just seeing the grid. <laughs> it's like looking at graph it, paper with a blue dot and you're knowing you're going that direction. It, and it's, that's kind of the dichotomy of the iPhone. And the thing that's so funny about it is so much has changed and so much has improved and yet so much has not changed. And the, the basic principles and the basic ideas of the iPhone remain the same. Even the general user interface, you know, the grid of icons, apps, home button, you know, run down the list. It all operates essentially the same way. They didn't have to shake it up like they did, you know, say with the Apple Watch, where they've kind of rethought what some of the hardware buttons do and how some of it works. The iPhone still works essentially the same way. If you were somehow, you know, uh, f- cryogenically frozen from 2007 testing your first iPhone and c- came to today and you picked up an iPhone 7 Plus, you'd be amazed at, you know, how much bigger it is and how much faster it is, but it would still, you'd be able to use it instantly. Right. But if you went back and had a Palm Pilot from, let's say, Oh, gosh, a good year to get one would have been like 1992, 93, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, if you had, well, let's say even later, right? If you had a Palm Pilot from 1996 or 97, um, and you looked at that thing, you would have a grid of icons. Mm-hmm. You would have a, a touch screen, although it would be one that operates with a stylus or a fingernail. Mm-hmm. Right? Black and white. Black and white. That was based on the ideas that came from Mac OS six and Mac OS seven. Everything that's old what, is new again. That's what they were honoring when, when Jeff Hawkins and Don Dubinsky made Palm and that same grid icon and, and layout and, and for the most part operation pretty much spread throughout all of the mobile devices, right? Windows CE had a grid of icons on a desktop with a start menu because they're windows. Um, you know, all of these things, BlackBerry was a grid of icons that you navigated with scroll wheel. That's a complaint I've heard from people that think that iOS is stale. They think that the grid of icons should be changed in some way, either to allow widgets on the home screen or to allow some level of uh, 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 modification to the icons. So, you know, like when you look at your phone now, the, the second hand on the clock moves and the calendar updates every day to tell you the date. Uh, why doesn't the Apple weather app, for example, give me the current conditions on the icon on it? And why doesn't Apple allow third party apps to do that? I think, you know, the, one of the problems with that and, and how you update it and how you modify that would be you don't want to unlock your phone and have it turn into just a bunch of dancing icons. It sounds like a total. Yeah, how much information are you going to actually convey on the icon space? And what are you actually going to be able to see with it's all crowded? I mean, I think you could dancing. do it. I think you could do it if you uh, 
put hard limits. Like, for example, one of the things they have on the Apple Watch is they limit how often the apps can pull for new data uh, because it just limits battery life. They're constantly looking for data in the background. Um, so maybe you could do something where you say you have an icon, you can update it, but you can only update it once an hour. And yeah. that way, and they can't be animated. It can just be a static image, and that image can update once an hour. So it could be current weather conditions, information that you need, whatever. Let's let's look to our partners in Mountain View for a second, our, our good friends at Google, who, when they announced their Pixel, did they put a ton of dancing widgets on the screen? No. They gave you a grid of icons, and they gave you a Google Assistant slash search bar up at the top that animates if you touch it, right? That's That's what they gave you is the same kind of thing. Well, you can put widgets on you, your home screen. You sure, sure you can. But what did they give you when you take it out of the box? Did they give you a bunch of dancing things that update? I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not saying that Apple should do that, but I think that they are, they've already kind of laid the groundwork with the, the, the secondhand, you know, moving, which was something kind of a tease to the Apple Watch, uh, uh, secondhand, and then obviously the calendar updating. You know, they, they finally a few years ago it used to say that it was always 72 degrees or 76 degrees on the weather app. They finally removed. Uh, a number from it because it was kind of silly to constantly say that it was whatever, but it still says it's partly. Well, especially if you're in Celsius, 76 degrees is like deathly in Celsius. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, it still says it's partly cloud or cloudy all the time. I think it would be okay to have a weather app and to allow third party weather apps, for example, that would show you in an icon, the current weather conditions, not unlike uh, the complications do on Apple watch. Fair enough. So we've talked a lot about the past. Let's, let's talk more about, What's ha- well, let's talk a little bit about development stuff, and then we'll talk about the future. So we ran a piece that Mike wrote up about Tony Fidel explaining early iPhone development processes. This began because we've, we've talked about before about how there have been different paths taken to how we arrived at the iPhone. And, and one of them was saying, let's use the iPod OS and the iPod um, architecture to try and do it. And the other was saying, let's try and do something different with a touchscreen. And, and, Apple pursued both paths while they were developing this. And a video surfaced that showed sort of a virtual touch wheel from a uh, iPod-style interface with uh, iPod menu navigation going on, right? We saw that video. So so what what's the story we wrote here and how did it happen? Well, um, to, to tie it back in with the iPhone announcement, uh, you know, before the first iPhone was announced in 2007... Um, people were wondering what what could Apple be making? What's it going to look like? And so one of the rumors was that it was going to be an iPod with phone capabilities. Um, and so Steve Jobs even made a joke about this on the stage during the presentation where he showed a rotary dial where the um, where the click wheel was on an iPod saying, here's our iPhone, you know, uh, this is what it should look like or something like that. And it drew big laughs from the crowd. Now, what's funny about that is with the story that came out is – it, while there was no rotary dial on it, it wasn't uh, that far off from at least a concept that Apple explored. But it makes sense that they would have explored that concept because the iPod was something that was well established. Everybody it's knew huge. how to use. Everybody knew how to use it. The interface was intuitive. It worked. And so, if you're thinking in terms of that logic, Apple goes, "Well, let's take what's working with this handheld device, and let's see if we can make that apply with a phone." And so, you have this leaked uh, user interface that came out from the very early days of the iPhone. Uh, when it was originally developed, it was not actually running on iPhone hardware. It was just running on prototype hardware, probably stuck to a wall somewhere. Well, the, the first hardware it was running on was a Power Mac G3 with a projector. Right. So uh, this was not something that was running on the iPhone as it came to be, but it was one of those things where as they were in the development phase trying to figure out what it was, what it was going to be, how they were going to interact with it. And so uh, the iPod team imagined something that was going to operate much like an iPod where – you were going to scroll your finger around on on there to uh, scroll through things and 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 that sort of you know interactive way of, of dealing with it. It wasn't until they took they they'd actually been working on a touchscreen Mac tablet that just wasn't coming together. The hardware wasn't there, but they had some user interface ideas about using your finger and and uh, touching the screen and all that. That they brought those elements over from the Mac side to this new secret project they were working on, the things really started to come together. But at Apple, as you have with a number of companies, you have um, competing ideas and competing ways of doing it. 
um, and different teams working to different goals and, and, you know, collaborating in whatever they're doing um, to try to find the best way to do this. And so, I mean, that's just part of the process is what it is. Uh, as you go through this, you, you test out these things. And so this click wheel concept interface obviously was never going to work, but it makes sense that Apple would have explored that and looked into it because it was a proven user interface. It was something that people, millions of people were interacting with their iPod and, and using it every day with that same input method. So what what happened in the writing of our story? Was there anything interesting about our story at all that made it uh, different from anyone else's stories? Tony Fidel uh, it plays a very important role in the history of uh, consumer electronics. Uh, he, for some reason, he's known as the godfather of the iPod. I don't know where the godfather part came in, but he's a, a very instrumental person in the creation of an iconic device. Um, and he, after, uh, many years at Apple left, uh, went on to, uh, found Nest, another successful company, which is sold. He and, he and Matt Rogers did that. Uh, Tony, I've, I've never met him personally. Uh, you've told me that you have, um, yep. you know, I, 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 I know, uh, of his reputation, uh, you know, from his time at Apple, from his time at Nest, uh, you know, uh, there's a publication called the information that last year had kind of a scoop on. Tony Fidel and struggles to keep the team in line at, at Nest and Alphabet uh, before ultimately kind of being ousted from there or leaving amicably or however you want to put he it. Took an advisorship, let's say. He he's an advisor and with Alphabet. Right, in the same way that Scott Forstall is still was still an advisor to to Apple when he left the iOS. I, I that is a saving face. Specifics that, I don't know. Right. Well, that's a saving face thing. That's fine. You know, the information had a story about the way that he treated employees and. Uh, uh, you know, there were some stories in there about telling people that they couldn't uh, go on their honeymoon and stuff like that. And what's what, was, what I found interesting about it was Alphabet and Google and Nest and, and Tony himself all participated in, and gave quotes on the story and explained why they did the things they did. They said they were in crunch time, uh, which is why they couldn't let this guy go on his honeymoon. So anyhow, uh, I say all of that to say that uh, uh, Mr. Fidel is a very hands on, uh, interested party. Um, and he apparently did not like in our coverage of this. Uh, I did not personally write the story, by the way, uh, that was published on this. But uh, uh, his public relations team reached out to us to uh, express some of their dismay in the way that the story was presented on Apple Insider. Uh, they particularly did not like the fact that uh, the uh, different potential iPhone interfaces were presented uh, in our story as competing user interfaces. Um, and they also didn't like the fact that it was presented as two competing teams of Tony Fidel and Scott Forstall. Uh, they preferred uh, that it would be presented as though they were all part of Apple and they were all working together to try to find the best interface they can. Uh, I have my ideas as to why they were so adamant about that. I think that uh, nobody wants to come across looking like they uh, backed the wrong horse. Um but I also think that 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 is an oversimplification of what happened. Uh, as I said, I, it makes perfect sense that Apple would want to uh, explore using an established user interface with a, their next generation product because it was familiar to people. It was known and it made sense in some ways. Now, it's easy to look back and say that's silly. That never would have worked. And yeah, that's probably right. But uh, even Apple didn't realize at the time how game changing it was going to be. There's no way any, anybody could have known. You know, you kind of put it out there in the world and see what happens, and then it takes off and it becomes this thing. And you know, every iPhone now is is copied what the what or I'm sorry, every smartphone is copied what the original iPhone kind of laid the groundwork for. But um, yeah, you know, in hindsight, yeah, the click wheel interface was never really going to work. You know, a, a, a scrolling your finger around, however you want to call it, um, on a device like that. But uh, yeah, that's the way it was. And, uh, you know, I, I think our story was a fair way. It's semantics at that point. Um, I think that uh, clearly there was some form of competition between different development teams at Apple. Um, and I think that that's healthy. I, I don't think the competition is necessarily a bad thing. And I don't think that they're necessarily winners or losers in those types of situations, as long as you're all working for the same company with the same goal. Yeah. And if you decide that one path is the right path very early in, in the concepting phase and don't pursue alternate solutions, then you potentially miss out on interesting things that you could discover by by being told to go and make it work, right? Be go and pursue this path, even though it might not be the right path. You, you, you don't know what you'd miss out on if you don't go down the road, right? 
Steve Jobs famously said that he was uh, one of the things he was most proud of is the things that Apple said no to. That they had developed internally that could have potentially turned into great products and sold hundreds of thousands, if not millions of units. It just wasn't part of their philosophy. And so they didn't do it. Right. But you don't say no early. You, you say no after you explore them. Right. I, I, I'm, I'm sure in Apple's, you know, Skunk Works Labs, they've developed everything you can imagine from cars to alternate iPhone prototypes to tablets running Mac OS. I mean, you name it. I mean, I'm, if they hadn't explored it, they'd be stupid. They have to explore it. They have to explore all potential options. Uh, I'm sure that they've developed next generation iPods in Apple, even though they'll never come to market. You know, they probably have a super cool iPod Nano. They're like, yeah, who cares about it? You know, but uh, they they would have to to look into those kind of things because that's what they do. Yeah. So instead of talking about the past, Neil, I want to talk a little bit about the present and the future. Okay. I, I want to tell you, thank you. I'm glad you've been here. This is the very last Apple Insider podcast episode ever. <laughs> You're not going to ask me questions about that? No. Okay. Well, that's it then. This is the very last one. And, and there's a very simple reason for why this is the last one, right? Um, yesterday, the New York Times published a, a popular segment called Confirm or Deny, Deny by Maureen Dowd, which is just a quick fire Q&A session that asks people in the headlines to deliver hot takes on current topics. And uh, Peter Thiel was, was asked whether the age of Apple is over. And he says, confirm, we know a smartphone looks like, we know what it does. It's not Tim Cook's fault, but it's not an area where there'll be any more innovation. So that's it. Apple has no more innovation and we don't need to keep publishing a website. Or doing a podcast. Yeah, well, you know, there's nothing I love more than hot takes, let me tell you. Well, I mean, but let's, you know, Peter Thiel, right? He was he was a part of the PayPal mafia. Um, he's, he's advising the president-elect. Clearly, he's a smart guy, right? So, that's it. There, there are plenty of smart people out there, and none of them can predict the future. I mean, let's be real. Apple is not going anywhere in our lifetimes. This is a company that... While they have flirted with extinction a few times, uh, is now so flush with cash and sells so many products and is such a big part of uh, the American psyche that it just would never. It's not going to happen. Period. It's just not going to happen. It would take something absolutely catastrophic for that to happen. Um, they will continue to sell iPhones. They will continue to sell iPhones in huge amounts. Now, all right, all right, right, right. Let's very, let's let's wait. Let hot takes confirm or deny. No. Apple still has room to innovate. <laughs> Of course, Apple still has room to innovate. That's in, that's <laughs> insane to suggest that uh, what we have now for a phone is what your phone is always going to be. If you were so narrow minded as to think that that is <laughs> it's just it's beyond stupid. Is Well, no, we, we there was a, a quote given in the early part of the 20th century that yeah. said that all the innov all the inventions that can be invented have already been invented. Something to that effect right? It's, it's tough to innovate when you have something established and also when you're confined by the constraints of modern technology and, and physics. Uh, Apple would probably love to have a iPhone that's as thin as a sheet of paper that you could fold up and would have a battery life. You have to charge it once a year, but you can't do that. It doesn't exist. There is no technology to make that happen. As technology gets better, you know, if that's their ultimate 500 years down the road goal or something, uh, you know, we just incrementally get closer and closer to those goals. But to suggest that the technology is not going to get any better or that form factors are going to change, or that new devices won't come out is beyond naive. It's it's just ignorant at that point. Um, and, you know, obviously, this is a, a hot take for a newspaper column. I don't know how much thought or whatever he put into this. I don't really care about what Peter Thiel thinks about Apple's future, but uh, this suggestion that the company is doomed or that they're not going to be able to grow anymore, not be able to innovate is, is it could end up being accurate. They may not be able to grow anymore, uh, but it is still very uh, uh, foolish to make such a bold prediction. Yeah. I, I want to correct myself. I said early 20th century. I was wrong. It was the late 19th century, uh, very late 19th century. An 1899 edition of Punch magazine has a, uh, a little joke that offers a look at the coming century, which was, of course, the 20th century at that time. And uh, it's, it's a person uh, asking to see a manager of a department for uh, 
patent applications. And right. it says, isn't there a clerk can examine patents? And it says, quite unnecessary. Everything that can be invented has been invented in 1899. So here we are, a full century and, and decades later, and we're doing it again. <laughs> and what was it? Bill Gates said that 256K of RAM was enough for anybody? Or, oh, or, or uh, Thomas J. Watson of IBM, who said, you know, the worldwide market for computers is probably around five. Yeah, and uh, Steve Ballmer, who said five hundred dollars for a phone, fully subsidized. Good luck with that. Yeah, or the Ed Colligan quote that we gave earlier, right? Those PC guys aren't going to walk in here and figure it out. A- Apple could never have known how big the iPhone was going to be, but to speak in such absolutes when it comes to stuff like that is. I mean, people have been proven wrong time and time and time and time and time again. And so to rule out Apple right now and to rule out innovation in the smartphone market in general is is a pretty dumb thing to do, I think. I mean, just today, uh, there's a rumor that both Samsung and LG are looking to launch in limited quantities these folding phones by the end of the year, you know, with these bendable screens. Bendable screens. And stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine, we've imagine been seeing bendable screens for ages. There was a Italian prototype six years ago that had a roll up screen. So you now imagine if you phone. had, imagine if you could bring back, you know, the old flip phone style, but instead of being this clunky thing that you put up to your ear, it was a small screen that you could make phone calls with, interact with, and then you could fold it in, into two essentially, or double its size, and then now you have this much larger landscape to watch, uh, video on, play games on, whatever. I mean. That's obviously a very appealing concept for a number of reasons. And so as the technology continues to improve, you know, improve, then maybe that becomes the next thing. Who knows? But to, to say that all innovation is done in the market is, is stupid. So you want a flip phone, do you? I, I would love to have a flip phone. I'm, <laughs> I'm all about it. I, oh, my I, goodness. I'm still on my iPhone SE, and I will... Uh, hang on to it until I can no more because I just don't like the bigger form factor. And so if I can get the best of both worlds with a, with a foldable phone, that would be great. Wow. All right. So I want to, ch- I want to move on to a little bit to, to something that is a little bit more in the, the present and future, which is the idea of interfaces going voice first. You know, we, we have Amazon Alexa, we have Google home and, and those things were very, very, uh, voice only and voice first and very present at the CES show that I was at. Um, but we got a story about Adobe demonstrating a concept of using voice to edit images on the iPad where you could edit photographs by giving voice commands, um, using something kind of like a Siri digital assistant. So, you know, you, you use the microphone to trigger a digital assistant and then make changes to the photograph, cropping the image to a square, flipping, reversing the flip, confirming changes, and, and you know, telling it where to post the image using kind of like a share sheet with verbal commands. Um, the, the verbal commands in their demo uses natural language structures. You know, I'd like to reframe this picture, make a square. Um, and, and following each command, the assistant speaks back, confirming that. So that's that's kind of a neat demo. And for me, it, it kind of harkens back to the old Apple digital assistant demo from years and years ago. You remember the one I'm thinking of? Yeah, yeah. They they had this sort of Mac that was a laid and flat book kind of thing that the person simply talked to to tell them, you know, do this to my calendar. Now those, research those were during, internet. to be fair, that was during Apple's dark ages, though. That was not... It was, and it was only a concept. Yeah, Apple but, under Steve Jobs would never have done a video like that. Oh, heck no. They would have just built it. Right. Which is kind of where we're almost getting to now. Yeah, you know, voice uh, use of technology, voice interaction, voice uh, primer as a primary method of control is very interesting to me. Um, when I was in college, I took a future technology class with this crusty old professor who was convinced that... Um, uh, in the future, computers would not have keyboards and everybody would use voice to interact. And at the time, I thought that was very silly. And I still do kind of looking back on it because uh, could you imagine working in an office full of people yelling at their computer? <laughs> we got to <laughs> like, get this professor on. We got to talk to this guy. Uh, so I, I think that he had the right idea that, you know, keyboards were going to become less and less important. But, you know, certainly you look at an iPhone and the keyboards there when you need it. And it's not when you're not, you know, same with an iPad. But 
you still need a keyboard and you still want to have silent input of text and and control of things during a number of situations, you know, for basic communication, text messages, whatever. You know, there's a reason that people would rather text than place a phone call. Uh, and it's not just because they don't want to have a conversation. It's because sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have to be silent. Sometimes you're at work. There's a reason when you go on Reddit, uh, GIFs are more popular than videos because people can't have the sound from the videos playing when they're at work, but they can look at a GIF. So... Uh, you have to think about all those kind of considerations as to when voice technology is is making sense. So when you think about like Siri, for example, there are some tasks where Siri doesn't really make any sense, but there are some complex ones where it does make sense, like uh, creating a calendar entry or a reminder or something like that. You can speak that infinitely faster than you can unlock your phone, open the app, pick the date, type it in, put in a time. You know, it takes forever. Um, and so you're seeing all these voice applications now. the new GoPro uh, can be you can start recording with your voice on it by talking to it. That makes sense if you have a camera that's far away from you that you can't reach, that you have mounted somewhere, you want to start the recording, you don't want to carry a remote with you. Uh, Alexa is a great example. You know, you can control music, you can do this, you can do that. I don't know if if talking to your computer to crop a photo uh, is going to work. This is an interesting concept video, but this seems like such a precision based task where you you can't really describe what you want you have to see it interact with it to crop a photo uh you know it, it almost feels like the the blind leading the blind or something when you're trying to do that uh, uh over uh voice i, I don't know how well that's going to work but it was an interesting concept video i like the idea i guess so the I had a discussion with a professor of mine years ago where we were talking about input methods. We didn't talk about voice at the time, but we talked about the mouse and the keyboard. And he says the mouse only knows a couple of words, right? It knows click, it knows double click, it might know left click or right click, but that's kind of all its vocabulary is, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and you might be able to say, okay, it also knows click and drag because it knows direction a little bit. But the keyboard has infinitely more vocabulary. So the deal with voice is is that with, when we're using the keyboard, we have to know the syntax of the thing that we're typing to. With voice input, we still need to know a little bit of syntax, right? When it's when it's something complex, like we tell Amazon Echo to tell something else to do something else, right? Tell Amazon right. to tell Geneva to set the oven to four fifty, mm -hmm. right? tell Amazon to tell, you know, something else to do something, right? Or, or the same as with Google Home, where you, you tell it to play Black Mirror from Netflix on the TV. Mm -hmm. You have to use the syntax to tell it what exactly you In want. In the right execute. order, with the right words, yeah. Right. The, the, the development that's going to be happening and is already becoming is, is that it becomes more flexible with the syntax because it's able to parse our intention out of the words that we speak. You know, we already have that with, uh, you know, Fantastical, the Mac and, and iOS app for calendaring, where I don't have to input the specific details in any specific order. I can put in the details of an appointment that I want to set, a calendar date that I want to set, and it will parse it out for me. And it does it on the whole correctly every time. Mm. That's a specific domain, calendaring. But we're getting there for all of these other things. But it still comes down to certain applications just don't make as much sense. You know, right. Photo editing with precision is going to be a weird one. Yeah. Uh, texting people with your voice isn't going to make a lot of sense. You know, of course, dictation's there when you want to use it. And in certain situations... I text people with my voice all the time from the car. What are you talking about? But sometimes you don't want to do that. Sometimes you're somewhere else. You know, having right. it as a primary input method, it always needs to be either a backup or an alternative input method. And for some people, editing a photo via voice might be the greatest thing ever. Uh, I feel like for most people that are cropping photos and that are going to go through the effort of that, they're Probably just going to want to do it. Probably precision of a mouse, right? Yeah. How do you describe how much you want to crop? Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. Or I don't where know, you I don't want know the right order to end, right? You could say, make that a square, but it's a square on the whole wrong thing. Yeah. And, and you're adjusting colors. How do you describe the color adjustments you want to make with, with voice? It's just, I don't see it working. Yeah. A little more, a little less, a little more. Right. It's, it's just I, at that point, you might as well have it on a touch screen or, or with a mouse or whatever. It just would be much more efficient. You, you need to look at the certain types of applications where it's going to make it more efficient. And if it's not going to make it more efficient, it's not going to work. Yeah. So I want to say about some of the stuff that I saw at CES with this with this voice interface thing. Um, I want to start by talking about the iDevices booth. So I, I, I devices was one among many that made announcements at the show that have HomeKit devices uh, that are also compatible with Amazon Echo. And they 
and I'm being very intentional about saying echo instead of the name of that voice assistant, because otherwise it'll prompt my speaker and I don't want to do that while we're doing the podcast. Um, as you can imagine, the, they, their booth was a Faraday cage that they'd, they'd actually put copper cage over and then built their booth inside the copper cage so that they could have perfect Wi-Fi and, and perfect networking within without interfering from other booths. And they'd arranged a bed and a kitchen and lighting and a living room and everything. And they had all of these devices set up with lighting and outlets and thermostat and, and all of it. And all of it triggered and handled by voice. And they had a recording that played through a script of a, of a couple talking triggering different devices for different parts of the day. You know, I'm home or uh, let's go to bed or, you know what, make me some coffee kind of thing. And those voice prompts actually activated the real speakers. They activated Siri, they activated um, the Echo product and triggered those devices. And they switched between Siri and and Echo pretty agnostically, uh, turning things on and off all throughout the home as if they'd gone through the whole period of a day. And it was an incredible demo. It really was well conducted and it showed off their products, but it really showed off the power of voice first for home control. Mm-hmm. And and so kudos to them for putting on a good show and it really something that I want to try and replicate. Do you think uh, that a lot of Apple's problems with HomeKit would be solved by an Echo competitor? I think so they have a couple of problems for f- that are that are blocking them. One of them is that they're they're so focused on security that they re- and and also collecting money that they require each product that's on the HomeKit uh, um, account, for lack of a better word, to to have the authentication chip in it. And if you're trying to introduce low cost products, it's a huge percentage of the bill of materials and raises the cost of the low cost product, which is right. is not what you want when you're trying to get over a barrier to entry. So that's one problem. And it's a problem in terms of, of manufacturers and their willingness or interest. It's also a problem when it comes to the consumer. Um, another problem is the, uh, the, the you, you have to be an Apple customer to buy into HomeKit. You have to have an iOS device in order to do it. So if Apple had a, a Echo competitor that also acted as the... HomeKit hub or bridge for access to the outside world, the way that currently an iPad or Apple TV does, that would go a very long way towards making HomeKit more appetizing to people. Uh, see, see, when retailers are shopping for this stuff and deciding what they'll carry in their retail locations, mm-hmm. they want to be able to reach a wide number of people. And so they look at something that's iOS only and they throw it out the door, even if it's the better product or, or even if it's the competing product, because they want to be able to reach people that have Android as well. And the voice first speakers like Alexa don't care. Right. Right. I can't find the answer to the question. I <laughs> Stop that. I told you I was trying to avoid saying her name. Um, so having the speaker removes some of that barrier, makes it more agnostic, especially if the accessories that work with it also are Android compatible for setup, because you tend to set up these accessories through the phone first. Um, although not necessarily, if there's a channel like a skill that you'd add to the Echo, uh, or or if you're setting it up through the Google Home app for Google Home, then it doesn't have to be uh, platform specific. It can be agnostic, but that's that's a burden that they're they're facing, right? That's one of the reasons why um, the Echo product and its accessories get picked up in retail, where HomeKit has been a little slower to start. Yeah, you know, there's these ongoing rumors of a dedicated uh, Siri listening speaker device that Apple might be working on. And I just wonder what it would be. Would it be an Apple TV? Would it just be a Siri device? Would it just be... Uh, cause would it, would it be intended? Would it be pre- presented as a personal assistant? Would it be presented as a smart home controller? Uh, how do you, uh, position this thing? What, 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 what would it be in this voice driven future that we're going to? Because obviously right now everybody already has an iPhone and it's already listening and just needs a command. If you have a watch on, you can use that. You can use an iPad. Uh, if you're near your serial remote for your Apple TV, right. you can use that. But, but Okay. So you can use the voice assistant from Amazon, whose name shall not be named, 
from the voice remote on the Amazon Fire TV. But it is not aware of commands given to the standalone speaker product from that same company. Uh, Google did this right. Google is aware of Chromecasts and everything else installed around. So you can say, Google, send this to my TV, and it'll send whatever you've asked for from the speaker command to the Chromecast. So they right. got that part right. Um, but here's the thing. You said you can do this from the phone. You can do this from the watch. You can do this from the TV. But all of those are different contexts, right? The, the watch is this thing that is now a fitness product that originally began life as a we don't know what it is. It'll do a ton, do a ton of things that run apps. You buy it, you might like it. The phone is primarily the phone and apps interface, but also has the voice assistant there for you. But it's not primarily the voice assistant. It's not voice first. It's voice is there. On the TV, you you have to grab the remote. And this is the same problem with the Amazon product. You have to intentionally press the voice button. And on Apple TV, Siri only understands TV contexts right. at this time. Not saying they couldn't change that, but at this time, that's what it's for. Uh, what they should have, or what they could have, is a voice assistant slash home control product that that's what it's for. And it just does those things and does them well. And if it understands that there's an Apple TV there and kicks stuff off to it, marvelous. But it's about being the voice assistant and home control, and that's why you know you want it. I'm skeptical that they would even focus that much on home control, considering that Siri launched last year on the Mac, and that doesn't even do HomeKit. You know, there's no telling with them. Right. They're they're thinking that you don't want to control your stuff from your Mac, that, that you want, when you're in your Mac context, you're about using her to research things for you. And they showed that. Find me images so that I can put them in my keynote presentation which is the same kind of idea, but a different context for TV. Show me all the Clint Eastwood movies so that I can choose one to watch. Yeah, I just I, find, I find Siri to be absolutely useless on my Mac. I have absolutely no use for it. Right. It's the wrong context. You don't have a use in that context, but you have a ton of HomeKit stuff. If you had a voice-only speaker that was the assistant and home control, you would use it. And as far as an assistant goes, Siri is so far behind the competition that... Apple would also have to increase its capabilities to answer your questions without looking at a screen. Because right now, if Apple, if if Siri doesn't understand what you're asking for, it just gives you Bing search results. Yeah, it, can't yeah, do that it, without it a screen. Fails over to search the web without really telling you anything useful there. So they've got some work to do. Um, let's talk a little bit about the things that I saw at the show, things that were announced. So Sylvania had a HomeKit enabled Bluetooth light bulb and the LifeX uh, plus smart bulb. So there's two lighting solutions there. Formerly, you'd have either things like Lutron to control switches, or you'd have the Philips Hue bulbs, which you have, I know. Um, now you can get other bulbs and it's not just this one kind of provider thing going on. iDevices, who had this incredible booth, right? They have in wall switches, they've got the wall outlets in wall and also outlet socket kind of things, dimmers, those cool stuff. They added a Bluetooth switch so that you can wall mount a switch wherever is convenient to control the other items. Except, of course, the thermostat, because what are you going to do with an on off switch to control a thermostat? Um, Incipio introduced the command kit Wi Fi smart wall switch. Uh, Leviton introduced Decker light switches, which are the nice, sort of modern, wide light switches. Fabaro has a flood sensor and uh, and uh, Ring had a floodlight cam. Yale, who had you know we've we've had a couple of different HomeKit door locks, right? We've got the uh, the Schlage Sense, which you and I both have on our door. Mm -hmm. uh, Quickset, who've had the Kivo line in the past, have introduced one called Premise, which I, I have here and I need to put on a wall, put on a door. Uh, Friday introduced a smart lock as well, and theirs looks very nice. When it comes to security cameras, uh, Omna, which is, gosh, are they a Netgear? I'm blanking. Uh, no, they're D-Link. Forgive me. They're D-Link. Introduced a HomeKit camera, and they can stream to the Apple TV, as did Withings. Withings introduced the Home Plus, which is a HomeKit-enabled security camera, also able to stream to the Apple TV app. Um, I have the original version of that that's not the HomeKit-enabled one, but uh, they, they announced the HomeKit one, which is pretty cool. Um, Lyric, which uh, we've, we've had before, you know, that's going to game HomeKit, HomeKit support coming soon. 
And um, they're a pro-installed security system with support for HomeKit. Um, also, Fibaro had motion and door and window sensors, which is, a, again, a part of security. Because it's a valid question. Do you need security system monitoring or is just having notifications telling you what's going on enough? Right. You know, having a monitoring service has its own benefits, but also just having notifications, hey, this door and window sensor opened right. is useful too, right? Um, there were a couple of different types of hubs that we saw. There were there were ones that were saying that uh, BLE accessories would allow them to be controlled from the cloud when you don't have an Apple TV configured. Um, there was one that was a hub that we saw that was on a, a very strange one um, from a company called Focal Crest, where they're trying to combine Zigbee and Z-Wave and and allow for HomeKit communication. Um, we'll see how that works. Yeah. NetAtmo introduced a smart smoke alarm. We, have, of course, had first alert with their HomeKit smoke alarm last year. Incipio had a power strip where each of the four outlets on the power strip is individually controllable from HomeKit. Uh, Chamberlain updated their garage door opener. So basically, a carrier introduced a smart thermostat. This has been a big year for HomeKit announcements. PureGear, uh, maker of, of fine cases and cables, have a smart outlet switch with a USB charger on the side. So you can charge USB and control HomeKit. Ton of stuff. Yeah, I mean, it, there's still a long way to go. Um, it's nice I mean, to it see was, more coming to market, but, you know. It, it, it was dwarfed by all of the stuff for Amazon's product. Yeah. But it's really good to see that there's this much out there because it says this is a live ecosystem. It's got a ways to go, but it's growing. Yeah, I mean, it needs to expand to to include more types of devices and Apple also needs to fix the fact that, uh, triggers don't really work the way that they should. Uh, but a lot of that is in Apple's court at this point. Yeah. And, and, you know, if, if we have faith and if we believe that, uh, Apple knows what they're doing, these things will get refined, right? I hope they're not going to give up on it. It 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 doesn't feel like a priority though. Well, you've got to think that engineers working on this feel this pain, right? They're setting up triggers. They know when stuff's not right. The question is, is this the stuff that gets refined in a point release update, or is this the stuff that you have to wait for iOS 11 to fix? Right. And and that's what we don't know. Let's let's keep going. So we we had our big MacBook announcements at the end of last year. What's the next kind of product release rumor we've got? Uh, it's expected that Apple's probably going to hold an event uh, either in March, April, that kind of time frame, probably late March, to announce its next generation iPads. Um, the expectation this year is that the 12.9 inch iPad Pro uh, is going to see an update, uh, and Apple is also going to introduce a new 10.5 inch iPad, uh, which has been the source of some confusion, I suppose. Um, as to why Apple would do that when they already have a 9.7-inch iPad. The belief is that the new 9.7-inch iPad that will be coming this spring will be the entry-level model, uh, perhaps going back to the $400 or $500 price point. Um, And then the iPad Pro will get a slightly bigger screen uh, with a higher resolution. So uh, someone did the math and figured out that if you were to take two iPad mini screens... Uh, and put them side by side, uh, you would have a, essentially a 10.5 inch screen. It would have the exact same resolution as the 12.9 inch model of the iPad Pro, and it would also have the same pixel density at 326 pixels per inch. So one of the things some people don't realize is that the iPad Mini actually has a higher pixel density on its on its screen than the 9.7 inch iPad. So uh, this would allow it to be a slightly higher resolution screen while using the same uh, printout, essentially, that uh, uh, that they make from component makers to make the screens for the iPad mini. Now, the interesting part about all this is despite making a screen that would be essentially two iPad minis side by side, there is no expectation that the iPad mini will be getting an update this spring, and it may not get an update ever. 
Uh, it may just be an end of life product uh, that they are just going to let kind of phase out. They haven't updated in a couple of years, and uh, unless they update it this fall, they they may not choose to. Uh, that was a low end market that Apple shot for with a you know uh, lower price point. Um, but uh, as the years have gone on, they've been pushing for uh, more expensive iPads with more features, and they haven't really been going after that low end market, kind of conceding it to companies like Amazon. Yeah, so this is pro, pro-er, and pro-est. Yeah, I, I guess. Uh, it, it'll be interesting to see, especially with the 10.5-inch model, if they do something with a thinner bezel or, uh, you know, if they bring about uh, 3D touch to the iPad, uh, per- perhaps do away with the home button um, in anticipation of an iPhone without a home button this fall. Uh, you know, Apple has a history of introducing technology in slower selling products first before they bring it to their blockbuster iPhone. Uh, you know, 3D touch uh, first came as force touch on the Apple Watch. Um, so it will be interesting to see um, if they ditch the home button on the iPad and what they'll do with that 10.5 inch screen. Because uh, I'm guessing they don't want to make the form factor bigger. I'm guessing they don't want to make it any larger. So they could shrink the bezel, do some things, and potentially uh, make it still fit in the same size as the 9.7 inch uh, iPad. Uh, but who knows? We'll, we'll see when they announce. Yeah, there's sort of a very real question is, is what's the right size iPad? Is the 9.7 inch the best one because you can carry it everywhere? Is the, the 12 inch one the right one because it's so big you can do in everything? Uh, although I see less and less of those on airplanes. Right, I see a lot of nine point sevens on airplanes. I don't see so many of the big ones. Yeah, I think the the the, the big one remains kind of a niche product. Um, I it's the seventeen inch laptop of the iPod world. IPod right, world. I, I I I love my my big iPad Pro, but I'll bring it with me on flights occasionally. But other than that, I just use it around the house on the couch. And so for me, I don't really need the portability. I'm not carrying it with me a lot. And even when I bring it on a plane, it's not like it's that big. It's still much more convenient to break out than my laptop. So. Uh, and it still fits in the same tablet pocket in my backpack. So uh, I, I really I prefer the bigger screen um, just for the things that I use it for and the things that I do. It just makes it a much more enjoyable experience for me. But I, I see why the 9.7 inch size is appealing to people. I mean, it, it's it feels very small. You know, it's only, you know, a couple inches difference uh, uh, between that and the larger iPad. But when you switch between them, you go back to the 9.7. It's like, ooh, this feels really tiny. Yeah. So let's talk about something that's not tiny. Tell me about the LG Ultrafine 5K. This is a 27-inch monitor that has essentially replaced Apple's Thunderbolt display now that Apple's got out of the uh, the display business. Uh, unlike the LG Ultrafine 4K display, which is 21.5 inches and uses USB-C connection, uh, this larger display is a Thunderbolt 3 connection which uh, opens up some new possibilities in terms of daisy chaining displays, more data bandwidth, that sort of stuff. Um, There are a few kinks with the initial hardware, especially with drivers if you want to use it in Windows. Um, And USB 3.0 speeds are actually slightly reduced when using the hub on the back of this monitor. Uh, But uh, we ran a review uh, this past weekend, and you can check it out in the show notes. But uh, it's a beautiful display. Uh, The picture quality is outstanding. Uh, it's uh, affordable. It's nice. You can uh, plug it in and take full advantage of your uh, new MacBook Pro with Thunderbolt 3. Uh, And it's discounted until the end of March while Apple has an ongoing discount on USB-C Thunderbolt 3 devices. So if you're looking to get one, it's a good time to buy. And tell me about the, uh, the color space on this thing. Why, you know, it uses the same wide color technology that Apple uh, has been offering on the iPad Pro and the iPhone 7 and now the new MacBook Pros. Um, more accurately displaying colors, uh, different shades of red and, and some other uh, shades that were not possible on previous displays. Uh, so it's the same display technology that Apple has been using on other devices, and this matches it. So essentially, if you like the retina display on your MacBook Pro, which is gorgeous, um, you get the same quality with this external monitor. It's not a downgrade in any way, um, and it's just a bigger, bigger space to do work with. So, 
and it's got a FaceTime camera in it and right. it's, um, speakers and microphone and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it offers a few features that the 4k model doesn't have. The 4k model is pretty bare bones, just speakers and the display. This one uh, has a little bit more to it. Uh, if you're looking for that kind of stuff, uh, thanks to larger form factor and also Thunderbolt three bandwidth. The reason the 4k monitor at 21.5 inches stuck with USB C is because Apple's 12 inch MacBook does not have Thunderbolt three. So, it would not make it compatible with that device. So in order to make sure that it would work with both the MacBook Pro and the 12 inch MacBook, they had to stick with USB-C. Whereas the larger 27 inch model, uh, the 12 inch MacBook wouldn't have the processing power to push that many pixels anyhow. So they went off the yeah. three on it. Well, if you connect this to a Thunderbolt 2 adapter and then connect it to a, a laptop over Thunderbolt 2, uh, you get 4K resolution. Right. And you lose the, uh, the DCI P3 color space. Mm-hmm. So it's possible to do it. It's just not necessarily useful. Right. If you want to take full, you would be better off buying another display at that point. Um, this this display is intended to be paired with Apple's new 2016 MacBook Pros with Thunderbolt 3. Yeah. Cool. So we recommend that if you've got one of those, right? Yeah. I mean, if you, if you want a display of that size, if you're looking for 27-inch big screen and uh, you're looking for a replacement for your Thunderbolt display, I know that a lot of our readers don't like the aesthetics of the LG. They think it's a little too bland, just the plain black border and all that. I mean, it's not as attractive as a Thunderbolt display, but you're not going to get a new Thunderbolt display with a retina display on it. So, uh, you know, find another 5k display that you like the aesthetics on, I guess. I don't know. All right. Uh, quickly going to go through a trio of articles. Uh, I'm just going to read headlines because these are all pieces of news that we can talk about just one thing. So first of all, uh, Senior Vice President Lisa Jackson of Apple was named as a member of the U.S. Department of Transportation Automated Vehicle Committee. This is interesting because, of course, we've been talking for a year now or more about Apple and autonomous cars. So, you know, they've, they've loaded this committee with existing automotive industry figures. They've got government officials on it and a couple of other people from Silicon Valley, uh, an aviation attorney from Amazon, Lyft co-founder, uh, Waymo CEO, a uh, Hyperloop senior vice president. But they're, so they're going to have policy over drones, planes, freight, trains, things like that. Um, and, and she's no stranger to government. She served on the EPA in the from 2009 to 2013. But it's interesting to me because obviously we, we believe that there's a rumored car project. Right. And interesting that an Apple chose an environmental person, but as you noted, has experience with the EPA. Um, also, coincidentally, the same day that Apple announced that she's going to be on this uh, advisory board or whatever you want to call it is the same day that the EPA, her former organization, uh, announced that they're uh, going to be uh, suing Fiat Chrysler for uh falsifying emissions tests with software and things like that. So just uh, as they're still going after uh, Volkswagen mm -hmm. executives. So yeah. uh, uh, very relevant uh, given the incoming administration and uh, ongoing concerns about pollution and global warming um, that Apple chose a, an, an environmental expert uh, to and an environmental advocate to serve on that board. Uh, obviously that goes a little bit beyond just her government experience. So interesting choice. Yes. Yes. Uh, alongside those, Apple loses a mechanical engineer responsible for the original MacBook Air enclosure to Tesla. So Mike Casebolt, one of Apple's hinge designers and the key designer of the original MacBook Air mechanical design, is now working at Tesla. He's a senior director of engineering on closures and mechanisms at Tesla Motors. And, uh, you know, you, you do have closures in a car. You have hinges. You have you know, doors, trunks, mm -hmm. and so forth. Um there's, he's not the only departure. Uh, Chris Latner, who was the architect of Swift, has departed mm -hmm. to Apple. And in November, we Apple lost a, a PR specialist to the company as well. So It's been going it's, on it's, behind it's, the scenes for a while, this uh, employee poaching uh, thing. Right, but not so high profile. Uh, I mean, Elon Musk has made some comments about how uh, his company is stealing more employees from Apple than Apple's stealing from him, but there's definitely some sort of a rivalry going on, which is interesting because they're not technically competing in any way, uh, at least officially. Um, but certainly opportunities at Tesla and Tesla is a company uh, that that uh, people expect very big things from, whereas Apple has a reputation for kind of holding people down and uh, taking a slower measured approach 
um, you know, uh, doing things a little bit more gradually, uh, whereas uh, uh, Tesla and, and Elon Musk specifically are, are quite literally shooting for the moon. So um, I think that, you know, you can see the appeal of people wanting to jump ship and maybe spread their wings a little bit more at Tesla. Uh, and I think that might be part of why you're seeing what's going on here. Yeah. So we'll follow this story. We'll be following more about the car in future. Uh, but it's intriguing. You know, it's, it's, it's one of these things where we're sort of watching this thing develop in slow motion. Right. And I want to close on a story that is interesting to me. Uh, I, I like to follow what Apple's doing with health. You know, it was very interesting to me when they had HealthKit and then started talking about CareKit and open sourcing CareKit. And so OneDrop is a, a company that announced a Chrome blood glucose monitoring solution with HealthKit on Apple's online store. So they're, they're selling this glucose monitoring kit through Apple's online store. It's a heavily iOS-based option for people with diabetes. And it's an FDA-certified meter, which transmits data from the OneDrop module to the app via Bluetooth. So it's got iPhone and iPod Touch support and a companion Apple Watch app and a lancing device, 10 lance, it's 100 test strips. And the, the lancet is said to sit flush against the finger in part thanks to adjustable depth settings. And so it requires just a small drop of blood in, instead of um, the way that some of the traditional meters work. Um, and, and of course, you know, the, the problem with these meters or one of the things that happens with these meters is that the money is made not on the, on the device, but on the uh, test strips. Mm -hmm. So you subscribe to a service called one drop premium, which costs $40 a month or 400 a year and comes with other benefits like a discount on the meter and access to diabetic support and a regular source of test strips. The mobile app's available for Android, but iOS features both HealthKit and CareKit integration. And the point of CareKit, of course, is you get to share your data with doctors and caregivers. Right. And and having an app that centralizes all of this and then, of course, centralizes it in, in the, the health app as well seems really important to me. Yeah, it's uh, interesting and, and obviously something that Apple sees a lot in that they chose it to be featured on their online store. Uh, you know, you know about how that process works and... Uh, what it takes to get into the Apple store and uh, how Apple will spotlight different products that it feels are kind of showcasing the capabilities of connectivity of its hardware and made for iPhone accessories and that sort of thing. So uh, it's pretty exciting and pretty interesting product. Yeah. And the, uh, the the product through the online store costs $99. If you go for the subscription, the price is lowered to seventy nine ninety five. And of course, the app is free download. So that is the news. And uh, and on that note, uh, this has been the Apple Insider Podcast, episode 103. Neil, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, you can read my stuff at appleinsider.com, and you can message me on Twitter at thisisneil, N-E-I-L. I'm your host, Victor Marks. I'm at vmarks on Twitter. And if you find Neil out in the wild using a flip phone, take a picture of it and send it to me at appleinsider.com. We'll talk all about it all about it next week on the Apple Insider podcast. And make sure you send it to Tony Fidel as well. <laughs> all right, we're out. Thank you very much. And please leave us good reviews on iTunes and send us your thoughts. We'd be love to we'd love to hear your comments and questions and we'll talk all about them next week on the Apple Insider podcast. <laughs>